You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you. Well, welcome back to uh, another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I'm Paul Garner. And I'm Todd Wood. And uh, we are uh, very glad to have you uh, here again for another episode. Uh, We're really looking forward to this one. Uh, Don't forget that if you enjoy uh, our podcast, uh, do make sure that you like, share, subscribe, leave a positive review, hit the notification bell, all of those kinds of things. And uh, we'll we'll make sure then that you uh, get notifications when the next episode goes up. So uh that's that's great um it all helps to uh, make us more visible to uh, other people and to help them find us and we're very grateful uh, for all those who've subscribed now todd um it's january and i always find january yeah. a, a very strange month it's it's a long month it tends to drag i find after the <laughs> holiday season yep. um it's cold and it's dark and it's a bit miserable and people get the January blues. So yeah. I'm hoping that we can dispel some of those January blues today. That would be nice. Yeah, it, it's the same here. I mean, <laughs> I've been staring out my window in my cabin now for good two months. All the leaves fell off the tree and now I can see the blue sky mm-hmm. sometimes. But otherwise, yeah, it's gray. Everywhere is gray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, but spring's around the corner, so yeah. so hopefully not long before we start to see the first signs of spring. But yeah. anyway, there we are. But uh, into this January darkness, um, we come with another episode, and uh, we I'm really looking forward to this because we have a very special guest, uh, someone who has been a good friend and a colleague and a mentor uh, to me personally. Uh, and uh, someone who has worked on uh, a research project that I uh, was able to be involved in, and that's going to be the subject for today. So welcome to Dr. John Whitmore, uh, Senior Professor of Geology from Cedarville University. John, it's really great to have you with us here today. Uh, It's good to be here with you guys, uh, Todd and Paul. Uh, It's been too long since we've seen each other in person. (laughs) Yeah, that's for sure. Yes. It certainly has. Yeah, it certainly has. Now, John, um, we've known one another for quite some time and we've worked together on on various projects over the years. Um, Why don't you just tell our listeners and our viewers uh, something about yourself, a little bit of your background, your uh, academic position and yeah, just just fill people in with a bit more about who you are. Yeah, well, I I teach at Cedarville University. Uh, We have a geology program here. And uh, along with masters, we're the only two uh, undergraduate geology programs that teach geology from a creation uh, historical uh, point of view. So we are are young earth uh, creationists and uh, we believe the earth is only thousands of years old, not millions of years old. And we uh, strongly believe in the history of Genesis. So we think that there's a flood record out there and and that uh, many of the rocks uh, that we see out there have been formed uh, from Noah's flood. Um, I was educated at uh, a secular school for my undergraduate, Kent State University. And then uh, my graduate degrees are from uh, Institute for Creation Research when they were still in California and then uh, Loma Linda uh, university and I have training in in both biology and geology uh, from those schools. Mm. Now, John, um, your PhD research was on uh, the fossil fish in the Green River Formation, yeah. and sometime we're going to have to get you back to talk about <laughs> the Green River yeah. Formation. But just just very briefly, tell us about the research that you did there because yeah. um, I. You, you weren't very popular, I, I think, at times with <laughs> yeah. the kind of experiments you had to do. Uh, I, I've heard yeah. stories of buckets of rotting fish. Is that right? Is that what happened? Yeah, well, uh, taphonomy is a stinky business. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's these uh, there's these beautiful fish in Green River Formation. In fact, I have have some some right here. So, oh yeah, on my desk yeah. here. But uh, um, 
I wanted to understand these fossil fish a bit better. And so the best way to understand fossil fish and, and how they end up in the rocks is to uh, rot uh, some real fish and see what happens to them. And so I, I learned a lot as they uh, rotted and decayed and uh, some of them floated and then bloated and then exploded. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sank down to the bottom and I was able to see many of those things in the fossils uh, that I collected uh, in Wyoming. Ah. So that's great. West Wyoming. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's gross. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my, John... my uh, lab uh, that I did all these experiments in was actually right outside my office. So you had to walk through the lab to get to my office. And it was a, a great way to cut down on an office track. <laughs> so this wasn't done outside in a shed somewhere? This was inside? Uh, well, I needed to do controlled experiments. Uh, so many oh. of the experiments that I did were inside. Uh, there was a hood going 24-7 in the lab. Uh, it helped take out some of the stale air. But I actually did do some experiments outside, too. I did some 30-foot tall uh, tubes that I put up against wow. my uh, uh, garage. And I had to get up on the roof and fill these tubes with water with the garden hose. I, I My neighbors probably thought I was quite quite uh, crazy <laughs> maybe i was <laughs> oh that's that's fascinating and um john you're you're you also serve on the board of the creation geology society mm -hmm. and you're a senior editor with the international conference on creationism as well i, I understand yeah that's right um the icc is uh is coming up uh, in 2023 uh, so we're in the process of collecting uh, proposals uh, for that conference and, and authors should start uh, writing here within <laughs> the next year. So, uh, yeah, that's that's coming up. We're having the, the ICC conference right here at Cedarville in July of 2023. Mm -hmm. And some people may also know that you're the co-author of this uh, textbook, The Heavens and the Earth. Um, just, just tell us a bit about the textbook as well, John. Yeah, so if you don't mind. Uh, Marcus Ross, uh, myself, uh, Steve Gormer, who's a, a atmospheric physics guy, and uh, Danny Faulkner, an astronomer, uh, we got together and, and published a book uh, from a creation uh, perspective uh, that deals with earth science. So it deals with uh, geology, oceanography, meteorology, and astronomy. And uh, really a unique book. We use it uh, here at Cedarville. Uh, it could be used for high school students as well for homeschool or something like that. And uh, yeah, that was a fun project to be involved with. Yeah, that's great. And how would people, you know, find out more about the book if they wanted to yeah, do that? The book is available on, on Amazon. You can find it on Amazon uh, easy enough, published by Kendall Hunt. And there's uh, paper copies and digital copies available, both. So. That's great. Now, we first got to know one another and first sort of collaborated, I think, probably way back in about um, 2006, 2007. And um, we published a paper at the International Conference on Creationism on the flood post-flood boundary. And um, that was kind of, I think, our first sort of work that we did together. But then we kind of got involved in this uh, thing, the Coconino project, and uh, that was funded. That was a research project that was funded uh, initially by the Institute for Creation Research, uh, ran from, I think, about 2007 to about 2012. Mm -hmm. But I know you've had a long interest uh, in the Coconino sandstone that goes back before that project began and, in fact, continues right down to the present time so yeah j just tell us a bit about your your sort of interest in the coconino sandstone and you know basically why why should we be interested in what what is the coconino sandstone why should we be interested in it yeah well i started looking at the coconino in the late 90s uh, when i was a student at loma linda and mm. coconino is a sandstone in grand canyon uh, so it was not far to travel there from southern california where i was in grad school and I, I had a, uh, a roommate actually in grad school who was also a geologist and we uh, liked to challenge each other. And so uh, we came up with this idea, let's uh, go out to the Grand Canyon for a weekend and uh, we'll hike down some of the trails and start looking at Coconino. 
and I'll take a, a biblical view of it and you know you take a conventional view of the sandstone and let's uh, challenge each other uh, in the canyon and uh, so that's how uh, this project uh, really started. Um, it's a really interesting sandstone it has uh, angled layers in it so uh, the layers I don't know if I can angle a layer very good with paper but something like that and those are called cross beds and mm. Most people, uh, when they see a sandstone with cross beds, uh, they will automatically think it's a desert deposit. So the, the angled beds would represent fossilized desert sand dunes. Mm. And so that's a conventional view. And uh, I, I uh, wanted to look at it from a biblical view and to have a desert uh, in the middle of a flood would be uh, very tricky indeed. <laughs> And uh, a lot of a lot of conventional authors, in fact, have pointed that out. And they they say that you know this sandstone, the, the Navajo sandstone, and a few others, uh, those are some of the biggest weaknesses in the big biblical model because you know you can't understand these uh, rock layers as desert deposits, especially mm -hmm. in the midst of a flood. And so, I wanted to uh, look at this formation and some others uh, like it with a little bit different view and to, to see if, uh, you know, we could find anything that would conclusively demonstrate that it was made underwater. Mm. So if I were to go, so if I, I want to set the stage a little bit more here. So if I were to go to Grand Canyon, would I be able to see the Coconino? Is it hard oh, yeah. to find? Oh, yeah. So here's my mug right oh. here. <laughs> a cross section of Grand Canyon. Convenient. Coconino, you know, uh, let's see if I can do this. It's right up there near the top. Okay. Uh, so it's a third layer down in Grand Canyon. Uh, it's uh, very light colored. So you stand on the edge of Grand Canyon, look out uh, right near the top. It's a nice light colored layer uh, just below the rim. So it sticks yeah. out pretty well. I Even, even yeah. I... A biologist of no geological training could figure out that's the coconino. Yeah, right? it looks okay. like a bathtub rim. So, okay. You know, okay. bring around the bathtub or something. Yeah. Is yeah. is it easy to get to? Can you can you hike down to it? Yeah. Um. All the all the trails in the canyon, uh, you can go down them and, and get to it. So I've done that and uh, hiked down all the trails that go through the coconino. I've hiked down at least to the the base of the coconino uh, to study it. Hmm. All right. So in the Grand Canyon, the Coconino, I think, is about 300 feet thick. Is that, is that right? Um, That's right. But it's thicker in some places. I think if you kind of go south of the canyon, right. it's thicker. And then it, it kind of thins out as you go further north. Is that right? Yeah. So as you go north, it, it really thins almost down to nothing along the Arizona-Utah border. Um, mm -hmm. It does uh, maintain its thickness as you go east and west a bit. I've uh, traced the formation from Arizona in California, all the way up in the D Dakotas. Uh, mm -hmm. So the name wow. changes as you go from uh, Arizona uh, up north. Uh, so things like it would be the Lion Sandstone in Colorado, uh, just in the Colorado Front Range uh, there uh, near Denver and, and Red Rocks and, and, and up north uh, into Fort Collins, it's the uh, called the Lion Sandstone. But it changes names as you go from state to state. But I've uh, been able to demonstrate it's a continuous uh, sandstone bed from California all the way up into the Dakotas, for example. Wow. So it's a very wow. extensive um, layer yeah. of sandstone. And within the, j just to kind of come back to this concept of cross bedding. So within the sandstone, you have layers of sand. And within each of those individual sandstone beds, sandstone units, you have this inclined layering called cross bedding that's right um so you have this sort of angled layering mm -hmm. uh, how did how did that form how, how do you get angled layers within a sandstone bed like uh, that? so on. when you have any kind of dune uh whether that dune be in the desert or uh whether it be underwater uh there's uh, things underwater called sand waves uh that really mimic and have the same shapes as desert sand dunes have so mm -hmm. Uh, those are called sand waves. But uh, when you have those dunes, uh, any kind of current like water current or air current that's moving uh, causes sand to avalanche uh, down that angled slope. And so what we're finding preserved in the rock record are those uh, av avalanche beds. Mm. Um, typically, 
uh, the angle of those in a in a desert setting can get quite high um, up to uh, the angle of repose typically and in some cases uh, special conditions you can even have them up to 40 degrees or so but uh, in, in deserts and dry sand those angles can be quite steep um, but uh, I just actually I just finished up a study where I looked at a, a whole number of cross beds uh, from desert settings and uh, the average turns out in deserts is about 20 degrees but it just spans the spectrum uh, all the way from, you know, uh, single digits up to 40 uh, degrees. And, and you see all kinds of uh, angles throughout there, pretty, uh, pretty evenly distributed. But you look at the Coconino and, and some of these other cross bedded sandstones, uh, those dips tend to be all clustered around 20 degrees. So the, the distribution of Crossbed dips in deserts is very different from the distribution that we see in uh, in the sandstones that we look at the re look at the record, like the Coconino. When you talk about this this angle and these mm -hmm. <laughs> avalanches, um, I think of I think of sand dune. I think of going to the beach mm -hmm. or something like that, where there are these sand dunes, right. and and there are Typically, I like to think of as kind of little little dirt waves, right? Sand waves, <laughs> where you have a little hump, and then you have another one, and then you have another one, and they're sort of parallel sometimes. Yep. And so what you're telling me is the, the wind will blow the sand up one side, and it yep. tumbles down the other. That's the angle That's you're right. talking about, that tumbling That's down? Right. Yep. Okay. And typically, that angle where it tumbles is right around 33 degrees. Uh, okay. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but uh, and that's that's for actual beach dunes above the water. It's about thirty yeah. three degrees. Beach okay. dunes, desert dunes, uh, 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 things like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that makes sense. All right. Cool. I'm just making sure I'm tracking what we're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> so the Coconino sandstone um, was quite intensively studied. Um, some some. Uh, decades ago by a Grand Canyon geologist called Edwin McKee. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about um, the work that he did, John, and what he concluded about the Coconino at that time. Yeah. I think that was 1934. Is that right? Yeah, he that's published... correct, Paul. Yeah. yeah. Um, Edwin McKee uh, was really a remarkable geologist. Uh, he had a very long publishing career. Uh, his early publications were in the early 30s. I think the Coconino uh, was one of his first ones in 1934, and some of his last publications were in the 19, early 1980s, uh, so over a 50-year uh, publication record. And uh, the, the uh, monograph on the Coconino was the first of many uh, formations that McKee published on in Grand Canyon. Uh, McKee is, uh, uh, without a doubt, the most uh, recognized uh, Grand Canyon geologist. He has uh, studied more of the formations in the canyon than, than any other geologist. And so as he wrote this monograph about the Coconino in 1934, um, he uh, suggested in there uh, that the Coconino was made in a desert. And although, he, you know, he, he did have a little bit of doubt as I read uh, that 1934 monograph, but uh, through the years, I think uh, the idea that it was a desert dune deposit became more and more entrenched. Uh, finally, in 1979, uh, McKee published a, a very lengthy uh, uh, edited volume with the United States Geological Survey. And in that book, he uh, used the Coconino as a type example of a, of a desert sandstone uh, deposit. And so he, he really said, you know, this, this one is the, the best example of all these uh, various sandstones of a, of a desert deposit. And throughout his career, uh, McKee uh, not only wrote stuff about Grand Canyon rocks, uh, but he also became uh, probably one of the best known uh, workers on sand dunes. And so he studied a lot of sand dunes in places like uh, Namibia and uh, uh, white sands in New Mexico and, and other places. Uh, he had some colleagues that studied a lot of coastal dunes in uh, South America, Brazil, uh, that, that they published on. So uh, a very uh, reputable and widely known geologist. 
Yeah. So, so he basically came to the conclusion that this was most likely a sandstone that had been deposited True. in a desert as, as windblown dunes. And this has been sort of picked up by a lot of critics of the young age creationist position because the Coconino sandstone um, is basically a Permian sandstone. It, it sort of sits right in the middle of the uh, sort of fossil bearing portion of the, the geological um, uh, uh, strata. And the idea is how, how on earth can you explain a windblown desert sandstone in the middle of a global flood? If, if these sure. sedimentary rock layers are formed during the flood, you know, how, 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 how can you have this desert sandstone? Um, and that's tell, pretty tell decisive, us. I think, don't you think? I mean, if, if right. this is true, that that is a desert sand <clears throat> dune and that that runs from California to South Dakota, that's not yeah. happening. <laughs> no, in, that's in a very year hard to underwater. explain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty much, that's kind yeah. of the end of the flood model there, I would say. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So tell us, John, then, you know, what, what have the critics kind of made of this? You know, it's become a bit of a poster boy, hasn't it? Yeah. So uh, the critics uh, uh, have said this is definitely a, a windblown deposit. Uh, there's no other way to interpret it. And they're uh, so entrenched with that opinion that they well, uh, they're very unlikely to even consider new data about it. They they think that the, the book has been closed. You know, the interpretation's been made, uh, that it's sound, and that, you know, there's nobody that could possibly find any data that would overturn that. And uh, so that's really been my goal, is to uh, uh, look at the Coconino carefully, uh, do some things that Edwin McKee uh, did not do, make some observations that, that he did not make. And to be fair to him, uh, really the technology to, to study uh, sandstones under the microscope has, has really improved uh, mm -hmm. since 1934. And uh, so Paul, you and I uh, worked on a lot of this together, but we looked at uh, the Coconino uh, under the microscope along with uh, some sandstones like the Navajo, uh, number of sandstones in uh, uh, Great Britain as well. Uh, you took me up to the look at the Hopeman sandstone and the Penrith and, and some other sandstones uh, there in England. And a lot of these sandstones are very similar. Uh, Permian in age, uh, which would be right at the top of the, the Paleozoic, uh, probably mid-flood, uh, something like that. Um, these, uh, these sandstones have, are often cross bedded. They're often uh, light in color or uh, reddish in color sometimes uh, um, uh, in some places. But, uh, you know, with these typical dips of right around 20 degrees and, uh, um, you know, sand sized grains and so on, sometimes with foot animal footprints in them, uh, not really sure what the foot, what the track makers were, uh, probably an amphibian or reptile of some kind mm. so we when we talk about the coconino sandstone actually there are lots of similar sandstones mm -hmm. uh, around that same level in the geological record not only in north america but also here in europe so it's actually a really right. widespread phenomenon so this is a big problem you know if these are desert sandstones we, we've got a really big yeah. problem here. <laughs> yeah <laughs> a big problem and and as we uh we're presented with the possibility of doing this project. I was actually a little bit nervous because I knew that, <laughs> you know, there'd been a lot published on it and most people had come to the conclusion that, you know, this was definitely a windblown deposit. Mm. And so as we are presented with this um, and, you know, any scientist that actually begins a, a project, the first thing that you want to do is become familiar with the literature. And so a project like this, uh, you search the literature, you acquire uh, the literature, and then you read uh, the literature to find out, you know, what's actually there. And in that process, uh, you come across uh, various places that you should go to look at it maybe and, and study uh, some of the conclusions that have already been made and, and whatnot. And so that was really the first step uh, in the project uh, that we did together. Um, we had to collect the literature and then we spent a lot of time in the field. So Paul, you came over uh, to the United States. Uh, I don't know how many times, but maybe five or six <laughs> times that, that yeah. we were out uh, looking at Coconino uh, in Arizona 
Uh, we also uh, went over into New Mexico on one of the trips and, and into Utah and, and some other places uh, out there. And then um, you want to collect samples. Uh, so we uh, collected samples outside of Grand Canyon. Uh, we actually had some sampling permits to collect within the canyon as well. And the next thing that we do is, is study these samples under the microscope. Uh, so a good friend of ours, uh, Ray Strom, uh, he would uh, take the samples that we collected, uh, take them up to Calgary, uh, where he has a rock uh, preparation lab. And he can uh, then um, cut those rock samples and polish them down thin enough that you can observe them under the microscope. And that was, uh, I think, really our, our biggest uh, contribution to the Coconino. There are virtually uh, no microscopic pictures of the Coconino outside of, of what we found. And I, I think uh, over the years, uh, people have only just looked at the, the macroscopic things they can see in the outcrop, and, and they've really ignored uh, the microscope work. And that, I think, is where we made our, our biggest advances, because we found some things under the microscope that, that just can't be explained in a desert environment. So people were making confident statements about what the Coconino was like, what the sand grains that make up the Coconino were like. But actually, virtually nobody had really looked at the sandstone under the microscope to see whether those things were really true. They were yeah. they were really looking at hand specimens, weren't they? It was really remarkable. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how many different uh, papers and books that I'd read where people claimed to know what the Coconino was like. And so they said all the sand grains were round or all the sand grains were the same size. And, and they published these very authoritative statements in books. And uh, even Christian authors would, would publish things like this that believe that the Coconino was, was uh, windblown. And they would confidently say that the grain sizes were all the same and that they're rounded, but um, they never really looked at the Coconino under the microscope. What, what they meant was desert sands are, are mostly rounded and desert sands are all have the same size sand grains. So since the Coconino is a desert deposit, it must look like that too. And so they published these statements without actually looking at the data or even referring to anybody who had done the microscope work. Uh, they couldn't cite anybody that had said those things or cite any pictures because they didn't have any. And uh, so that really was, I think, a big accomplishment uh, for us. And, you know, the, one of the things we found under the microscope is that the coconino grains are fairly angular. Uh, they're not rounded like we find in desert sands. And the coconino grains aren't all the same size. Uh, um, in desert sands, that's pretty typical, but we looked at the coconino and there's uh, sorting metrics and stuff like that that we have in geology, but we really determined that the Coconino was not well sorted, that it was at best uh, moderately sorted, and in some cases poorly sorted. And it was, uh, as we started seeing that under the microscope, I was really shocked that, you know, the geologist had missed this so badly. And, you know, we um, didn't just collect uh, Coconino samples from a few spots. Uh, we really uh, wanted to study the breadth and the, the depth of the formation. And so uh, we have samples, Coconino samples from all over uh, Arizona. I think we had almost 200 uh, thin sections or so from just Arizona alone. And then, you know, outside of Arizona, many, many more, we looked at over uh, 400 thin sections from coconino related uh, samples. So, you know, we wanted to really do a thorough job. And uh, of, is, of is that common? The microscope. Uh, is that's that, is, not common. Okay. <laughs> uh, thin, thin sections are quite uh, expensive to make. They're, they're time intensive. It takes a lot of time to cut the rock and then polish it down thin enough so you can see it under the microscope. And uh, Ray Strom did that work for us up in Canada, and uh, just uh, uh, that was um, the biggest uh, labor part of this project, and, uh, and Ray is to be commended for that work that he did uh, for us on this project. 
But it's quite important, isn't it, to, to oh, study yeah. a, a large number of samples because that's the way you get good statistics and so you can have more confidence in, in what you can say about the nature of the sandstone. Um, so just try and put this in, in, a, in a bit of context for us. You know, we've talked here about um, the size of the sand grains, the sorting of the sand grains. What, what does all of this, this mean, basically? So you can measure the, the size of the grains. You know, you can, you can measure them under the microscope. Um, the sorting is to do with um, whether all the grains are basically the same size or whether you have lots of big grains and small grains together, that kind of thing. Uh, how does this give you clues, insights into the processes that actually formed the sandstone? So uh, we not just looked at stuff under the microscope, but we actually went out to modern desert uh, deposits and collected you know, bags of sand so that we could study the, the modern sands under the microscope as well. And, you know, one of the things you see right away as you begin looking at these modern sands under the microscope is that you do see most of the grains are all the same size. Uh, you do see that the grains are, are well rounded and they get rounded by, you know, just colliding with each other uh, in the windblown environment and it chips the corners off and so on and, and it makes the sand grains round. Uh, also in deserts, we were able to demonstrate that uh, very soft minerals like micas uh, fall apart very quickly. And, you know, we didn't find micas in the, in the desert environment. Um, in the desert environment, uh, minerals like uh, feldspar uh, get well rounded. And we were able to see that from our uh, collections of, of modern dunes. And so what we did is, you know, with all these Coconino samples, we're, we're trying to understand them. And, you know, we're seeing poorly sorted uh, sand, we're seeing angular sand, uh, we're seeing a lot of mica in the Coconino, we're seeing these angular feldspars. And so we really look to see, well, is this the same thing that we're seeing um, in these modern sand dunes? And it really wasn't. And so another aspect of the uh, project that we did is we looked at beach sand and there's some uh, very nice publications on beach sand and we started looking at the beach sand and the beach sand has stuff like mica in it it has things like angular feldspar and so uh, a lot of our rock samples from the coconino were looking more like you know beach sands or sands that were uh, subaqueously uh, made and and not anything really like the, the desert sand and that, that uh, really led to some really interesting experiments uh, that we did. So I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about those experiments um, involving large jars. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you help me a little bit before you start that one? Um, yeah. Feldspars and what did you, what was the other one? Micas? Micas, yeah. So what, what? What These is that? Minerals. What what evidence does that give you? What does that tell you? So most uh, desert sands are made of quartz. Uh, quartz is a very common mineral. It's very com You know, it's it's you know, if you go to a beach or a, a sand dune, that's mostly what you're going to see in there. Uh, usually, eighty to ninety percent. Uh, but there's some other minerals in there. Uh, minerals like feldspar. Uh, it's a little bit softer than quartz. Uh, and then uh, there's another mineral that's usually uh, not very common, but it's called mica. There's actually a couple types of mica. And mica, you can peel apart into these thin sheets. And okay. uh, there's a black mica and a silver uh, colored mica. But it peels apart. You can actually peel it with your hands, peel it in its sheets. And it's soft. So it's about as soft as your fingernails are. And so you can actually scratch a, a mica flake with your fingernail. And what, uh, what we were seeing under the microscope was that um, our coconino samples had feldspar in them and had these mica flakes. And, and we knew we weren't, we weren't seeing that in the, the sand dune deposits at all. And so uh, this led to some experiments, especially with the mica. Um, I had a student that took a pickle jar, you know, one gallon uh, pickle jar. And uh, he put some sand uh, that had a lot of mica in it. I got it down from uh, South Carolina. 
and put some sand in there. And then uh, through the lid, he drilled a hole in the lid and put a remote control airplane propeller um, inside the lid with a, with a motor on it, whatnot. Screwed the lid on and then he could start that propeller and the propeller would make the sand go around in the bottom of the pickle jar. He didn't make the propeller go really fast. Uh, he was able to dial it down a little bit just so the sand would gradually move around the bottom and, and it actually made a dune, a little dune on the bottom of the pickle jar. <laughs> And his goal was to see what happened to the mica. <laughs> and so he ran this thing for a couple of weeks and, and took a look. And he said, uh, Dr. Whitmore, um, my mic is all gone. <laughs> and I said, well, you might have to check this thing a little more frequently. And so he started checking it, you know, every six hours or something like that. And he found out that the mica disappeared uh, within most of it was gone within 48 hours and wow this this was uh quite remarkable um and you know what happened was these hard quartz sand grains were just uh beating the mica uh and just ripping it apart and so mm -hmm. it you know it was just ended up as dust uh yeah. in there so this is like sandblasting basically this is Kind when like we need that. to clean yeah. metal, we take a right. sandblaster and blast stuff <laughs> off of it. This is what's, even with a gentle little yeah. blowing of this little motor, yeah. you still get stuff just gets blasted away in the sand. Right. Okay. And so, you know, we were pretty confident at that point that, you know, that's why we weren't seeing mica in deserts. And yet we had all these mica flakes in the Coconino. But there's still one more experiment we needed to do. And I had another student uh, took the same pickle jar, uh, filled this pickle jar up with water, and then put uh, the mica rich sand in there and then turn uh, the pickle jar sideways on a rock tumbler. And so this rock tumbler would go around and around and around. And you could actually see the mica flakes floating around in there. You could see the mica in the sand. They're kind of shiny, so you know they're easy to pick out. And this thing was sitting right outside my office, same place where I did all these fish experiments. And, uh, you know, this thing was kind of noisy. And finally, after a year, <laughs> we could still see mica flakes floating around in there. I said, okay, it's time to stop this experiment. <laughs> so the mica in water, the mica doesn't disappear at all. And, you know, what, what's hmm. happening, we propose, is that the water kind of cushions the contact uh, between the quartz sand grains and the mica. And so it doesn't chew the mica up uh, like the desert does. Hmm. And so we actually published this. Uh, we published as a real simple experiment, really a um, science fair project. I mean, a high school kid could have done this for a science fair project, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we were able to publish it in uh, Aeolian Research, which is a conventional uh, journal that scientists publish sand dune stuff in. And, you know, with this, uh, the mica research, uh, I don't know how you can explain mica in the Coconino at all in the desert setting. And this, this formation is so big um, and we see mica throughout. We see it, we saw it in almost every thin section we looked at. And it's not just in the Coconino. Uh, we have uh, samples from Great Britain that, that Paul collected that we found mica in, other sandstones, cross-bedded sandstones like the Navajo and so on. We, uh, the lions, we found mica in those deposits as well. Uh, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, all these deposits were made underwater and you can just argue that from the mica if you wanted to. Now, that's great. Now, uh, we've talked about the um, the experiments that you've done. We've talked about looking at the coconino under the microscope. And already, you know, there are lots of clues from what we've seen that the coconino was, in fact, deposited in water and, and not in a desert. But there's actually lots more to this story. So after the break, come back and join us and we'll we'll pick up the story from there. We'll see you in a couple of moments. You've been listening to Todd and Paul Talk Creation. If you'd like more information on sponsorship opportunities, or maybe you'd like to have a product or book reviewed or discussed on our podcast, please contact us at podcast at 
That's podcast at corsi.org. Thanks for listening to Todd and Paul Talk Creation. If you would like more information about what we discussed today, be sure to check out our show notes at corsi.org slash podcast. That's corsi.org slash podcast. Well, welcome back. Um, We're back to our conversation with Dr. John Whitmore, a senior professor of geology at Cedarville University, and uh, he's telling us all about his research on the Coconino sandstone. Now, John, we've we've already talked about the uh, crossbed dips. Um, you <clears throat> measured lots and lots of crossbed dips, didn't you, in the yeah. uh, Coconino project? Um, tell us how you do that. How do you actually measure um, the dip of these crossbeds, and what did your studies tell you about the crossbedding? Yeah, I measured uh, over two hundred, and and you measured some of those with me, Paul, uh, in the Coconino. Um, I had a, uh, a graduate student who just recently got her PhD from uh, Loma Linda. Uh, she also measured over 200 crossbed dips. And then um, you can actually go to literature, uh, 1938, uh, Raichi, uh, where he has a lot of crossbed dips, uh, hundreds of crossbed dips from the Coconino, the Navajo, Wingate, and, and some of the other formations um, in the West. And uh, these measurements are made with something called a Brunton compass. Uh, so you can uh, put the compass on, on the rock and you can measure uh, the angle of dip uh, from horizontal. And uh, it's fairly easy to do. Um, I would always uh, take a bottle of water with me and pour it on the rock so I could you know, know exactly which way uh, the, uh, the maximum dip angle was. And that's, that's how you wanna measure these dips. Uh, but, you know, the vast uh, number of measurements that I made uh, were with the Brunton Compass. Uh, this was uh, before the days of the iPhone, <laughs> but uh, now with the iPhone, uh, you can get apps for your iPhone to just lay your phone on there and it just gives you strike and dip almost immediately, it records uh, GPS uh, coordinate and everything else. And so uh, dips are... Uh, really easy to make uh, nowadays with uh, with the new technology. Wow. Mm. That's great. And those crossbed dips, um, are, are they consistent with uh, the sandstone having been deposited in, a, in a, an aqueous environment or a desert environment? Or, you know, what, what so, can you tell from those dips? You know, so I, I came up with averages uh, for uh, the Coconino and some of these other uh, cross-bedded sandstones, the average is 20 degrees, or a rate about 20 degrees. Turns out that if you look at all the cross-bed dips from deserts, uh, that average is, is also about 20 degrees, uh, surprisingly. But here's the difference. Um, when you look at um, desert cross-bed angles, uh, there's a wide range of dip measurements all the way from just a few degrees all the way up to about 40 degrees. Hmm. And so in the, in the deserts, there's a really wide uh, range of data. When you look at the Coconino data, uh, that data ranges, uh, most of the data points fall within about 17 to 23 degrees right in that range. Hmm. And there's almost no measurements of the hundreds of measurements we did and, and other people have done uh, there are almost no Coconino dips of 30 degrees or greater. And so it shows that there is something really different about the, the crossbed dips um, in the Coconino and other sandstones compared with modern dunes. And it's not just a matter of compaction. Some people have argued, well, you get these desert sands and they compact and that's why the angles are, low, are lower. Uh, it's not just a matter of compaction because if you uh, compacted the whole range of dips that you find in the desert, um, you're still going to get a, a whole bunch of, of dips in the lower range. And that's not what we're seeing in the Coconino. So, you know, the compaction is, is no longer an argument that can be used uh, to explain um, the distribution of these dips. So you talk about the range in the desert. You're talking about in a single desert, not just different deserts you've sampled, but within a single desert, you can get this big range of values. Yeah, within within a single desert. And, you know, you look at okay. measurements from other deserts and, and the same thing is true. There's a range, okay. a wide range of dips uh, mm. that you find. Mm. 
And interestingly, a lot of the data uh, that I used for this study was collected by Edwin McKee, uh, the same guy that did the Coconino, and, and some of his uh, colleagues from down in South America. So I'm, I'm using data that, you know, from people that, you know, thought the Coconino was a windblown deposit. Right. So that's interesting. So there seems to be something different about the distribution of the crossbed dips in the Coconino compared to modern desert sands as well. And there were some other really interesting um, features that you, you've studied in, in the Coconino. Um, one I, I know um, you've had an interest in for a while, and those were the sand-filled cracks mm -hmm. at the base of the formation. Um, so t tell us about those. Yeah, so um, if you go to Grand Canyon, uh, the most one of the most popular trails to hike down is Bright Angel Trail, and that uh, leaves from uh, the visitor center uh, right there at the uh, South Rim, the little village there at the South Rim. And you get down, you walk down the trail, you get down to the bottom of the Coconino, and there are these uh, very large cracks uh, that you see that go down into the Hermit Formation, and they're filled with Coconino sand. And uh, some of these cracks are, are incredibly deep. I've, I've measured some up to uh, almost 50 feet uh, deep, uh, about 15 meters uh, for, for those of you um, more familiar with the metric system. Um, and, and that isn't even the deepest. Those uh, 15 meter cracks disappeared into talus at the, at the base of the cliff. Uh, so they're deeper. I don't know how deep. Um, and that was really the first thing that interested me uh, in studying the Coconino. That was kind of the first project I, I worked on. And a lot of people had suggested that, you know, the hermit formation below the Coconino was, was made in this floodplain. And then the story goes that the sun comes out, bakes this floodplain, and the floodplain develops these big mud cracks. So you've seen mud cracks probably in, in, you know, a mud puddle or something. Well, these are great big ones that are really deep and they can happen in deserts today. I've seen some that are, that are fairly deep, uh, not to that depth though, but, um, uh, and then the story goes, uh, this, this whole area is drying up and the desert sands blow in and fill up these cracks. And so uh, that's the, the working hypothesis that, that people have published that these are filled up, you know, mud cracks. And so uh, I, I started thinking about this and, and there was something that always bothered me as I was looking at, at all these cracks down the trails. Um, if the sand is falling into these cracks from up above, you should see horizontal layers uh, in these filled up mud cracks. And most of the time there was no layering at all in the cracks. And some of the times the layering was actually vertical in the cracks. And I just, I, I thought about this for maybe a couple of years before something finally occurred to me. Um, it, and it really bothered me. And finally I thought, now, wait a minute. The deepest cracks that I know of are right next to the Bright Angel Fault, which pretty much the Bright Angel Trail goes right down. And the, the largest displacement on the Bright Angel Fault is, is right there where I'm seeing these, these very deep cracks, these very deep sandfield cracks. And as you trace the Bright Angel Fault across the canyon, the displacement on the fault is, is not as great. It's about 200 feet or so on the south rim. Over in the north rim, I think uh, maybe 50, 60 feet, something like that. But the cracks are shorter over there. And as you go along the rim and get away from the Bright Angel Fault, um, the cracks become shorter and eventually disappear. And so finally, what I came up with was that um, the uh, energy of the faulting, the movement on that fault uh, liquefied uh, the Coconino sand. It would have had water in it for this to happen, but the sand was liquefied. And then as the faulting uh, took place, uh, there are some conditions where the sand was under pressure and actually forced its way downward into the hermit formation to make these cracks. And that would explain um, why most of the sand filled cracks had no layering in them, whatever. Typically when sand is mobilized uh, like that, it uh, destroys all the bedding. And if there is bedding, usually it's parallel to the flow. And so that's the vertical flow that I was see that I was seeing. 
And I, uh, you know, presented this at, at uh, places like the Geological Society of America. That's often where uh, geologists go and uh, test out uh, some of their ideas. And uh, then I eventually um, got enough information together to write a paper, and we published that in uh, Sedimentary Geology, a secular uh, geology journal. And the, the thing that's uh, really important about that study is that in order for that to happen, the sand has to be sand. It can't be turned into rock yet. And um, the, the timing, I think, is really significant from a young earth perspective of these uh, injectites. So conventionally, the Coconino is supposed to be about 275 million years old or, or thereabouts. Um, this uh, faulting that happened conventionally happened about 50 million years ago. And so there's about 225 million years between the deposition of the Coconino and this faulting. Well, over 225 million years with a pile of sediment that's on top of the Coconino sandstone, that, that sand would have clearly been turned into rock. Hmm. But it has to move you know, when that faulting happens. And so it, it means that the faulting happened only shortly after that sand was laid down. And the, the sand had to have water in it for it to be mobilized like that. And so I think that these uh, um, sand filled cracks, uh, the term for them is sand injectites. Um, I think these injectites uh, were made uh, shortly after uh, the Coconino was laid down and uh, it was made before it turned into rock and it was is wet. And that scenario fits very nicely within a flood model. Uh, you have the, the, the flood laying down uh, the Coconino. Uh, less than a year later, uh, the water is draining off the continents. Uh, this faulting takes place and that's part of the uplift of the Colorado Plateau and so on. Uh, and as that faulting takes place, uh, that's when the sand was mobilized. And that scenario eliminates uh, hundreds of millions of years from the section in Grand Canyon. You can't have long time periods if that's the correct story. And uh, I don't really know how that story might work in a conventional view. Um, and I, I kind of uh, presented that to one of the geologists at the GSA meeting. And once she realized that that the, uh, it could only be explained in the young earth. Uh, she was really mad. <laughs> <laughs> you really do get that way. Yeah. yeah once you, she... once you lead them to the proper conclusion, they then no, Oh no, no, that can't be right. There must be another explanation. Right. Yeah. So once she realized what the explanation was, and that was the only way that it could be explained, uh, she didn't like me very much. <laughs> <laughs> so this is fascinating. So in effect, what was originally thought to be an argument for a desert environment, for this sort of dry, arid environment, not, not only upon closer study, actually turns out to have a very different explanation, mm -hmm. um, but it actually kind of has become transformed into an argument that is uh, consistent with the, with the young age model, That's right. uh, which is really, really fascinating. Um, <laughs> There was another interesting discovery um, that actually one of our um, friends and colleagues, Guy Forsyth, made. Um, <laughs> he lives in uh, Sedona, mm -hmm. which is south of uh, Grand Canyon. Uh, but he is a keen hiker and he hikes all around um, the area where he lives. So, John, <clears throat> tell us you know, what he found, because he co contacted us with this. And then we all went out, didn't we, as a group to go and do some hiking with him and look at these things. Do you remember and how it turned out hike was? <laughs> it really was, yeah. <laughs> so and, and it uh, we, we ran out of water, I think, didn't we? Uh, <laughs> we did. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it turned out to be really significant, actually, the discovery that he'd made. Yeah, so um, the Coconino is about <clears throat> a thousand feet thick uh, down in Sedona. It's uh, wow. uh, about 100 miles or so south of Grand Canyon. <laughs> and um, I had uh, talked with Guy uh, earlier, and, and he said, uh, you know, if, if, I, if you had your wish list about what we'd find in the Coconino, uh, what would you want to find? And I said, well, some, 
some really nice folds uh, would be nice. And uh, he found them and they, <laughs> they were absolutely incredible, just astounding uh, to me. I still remember sitting at my computer, uh, opening up some photographs that he emailed me and I was out there to look at those, uh, those folds within the month. Um, they were just so exciting. But I really wasn't sure uh, what they were at that point or how to explain them. And here's the scenario uh, that I came up with. So you have these uh, cross beds and that are being laid down. And, and what actually happens is that water currents can bend cross beds over and make what we call a recumbent fold. So you can see uh, that the shape here, this is a parabola. And this would be a parabola lying on its side. And so the, the folds that the guy found are called parabolic recumbent folds. And these can only form underwater. Uh, they form at the same time the cross beds are, are being laid down. Uh, there's actually a couple different ways that, that you can uh, actually pull the sand grains apart temporarily and, and make, the, make the rock turn over. <laughs> But these are called parabolic recumbent folds. And, and I think that they conclusively argue the Coconino is made underwater. I can't think of any other mechanisms uh, that explain that better than the parabolic recumbent folds. Um, mm -hmm. Some people have attempted to explain some things like that in the Navajo, but ultimately I, I don't think those explanations work very well because these folds occur, uh, we found a, a section where they occur over a distance of 400 meters. Mm. And you just can't have a local sand dune failing and, and produce such a long fold uh, like that. Mm. Uh, the sand has to be mobilized. Um, it, it, it looks like it has to be mobilized at the same time the cross beds are forming because the sand above and below it is not disturbed. And so... <laughs> It's a, it's to geologists, it's what we call a peony contemporaneous process. It's a process that's happening at the same time the, the rocks are, or the layers in the rocks are being made. Hmm. Yeah. And if it was just formed, as you say, by the slumping of a dry desert dune uh, or even a damp desert dune, then, you know, we, typically those, those kinds of structures are, are much smaller in scale. It, and they have some unique features that we don't really see in the Coconino yeah, folds as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Um, so this looks one like. Other, can, I, so, can I butt in here for a second? Mm, here? This, so sure. The pictures he sent you, this, it would be <laughs> like the layers of my, my boards back here. That's right. But what? It folds around and goes back the other way? Is that what yeah, it would look like? So they're like uh, parabolas lying on their sides. Okay. So they would look like that. All right. So like, you know, like you're folding a towel. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And, and right. this would be extensive. We've, we've traced them, some of them over 400 meters. Uh, okay. There's a All really right. nice uh, 50 meter section that you can see the whole thing along the side of a cliff 50 meters long. Wow. All so. right. And another discovery, John, that I, you know, I, I wanted to mention um, is dolomite. Uh, we've we've talked about the discovery of the mineral mica and the fact that this, you know, is consistent with a with deposition by water, but we we also found dolomite in a number of different forms in the Coconino. Um, tell us about the significance of that. Yes, yeah, so Paul. Um, what's ama amazing about the Coconino is that each of these things that we've talked about individually, each one of those things by itself, uh, we could argue that the Coconino is made underwater. And you know what we found is we found not just one evidence, but we found multiple lines of evidence that this uh, sand was laid down underwater. And dolomite's really interesting in that dolomite um, is not forming today. Uh, dolomite is a uh, clearly a marine uh, mineral, um, and and we find dolomite deposits uh, all over the world. Uh, we've got it right here in Cedarville. It's called the Cedarville dolomite. Uh, it's very similar to limestone. Uh, limestone is a calcium uh, carbonate uh, and dolomite is a calcium magnesium carbonate. And um, it turns out that the Coconino uh, doesn't just have dolomite here and there. Uh, there's uh, dolomite in a number of different locations in the Coconino. 
Uh, so we far, first started seeing dolomite in some of our thin sections. Uh, we saw dolomite cement. Uh, we found uh, some really large uh, pebbles of dolomite um, in the Coconino. Uh, we found uh, crystals of dolomite in the Coconino. Uh, but what really blew us away is, is we finally located some dolomite beds uh, within the cross bedded Coconino sandstone. And I still remember Ray and I were on the, the north rim of, of Grand Canyon. It was out in a very remote place called Parashant uh, Wash. And we had driven this uh, little four-wheeler four out 25 miles uh, into, the, into the canyon. And we hiked up uh, this cliff and there were these uh, thin beds uh, that were there. And we started poking around and, and they were hard. And, you know, the, the fracture, as you broke the rock, the fracture looked kind of weird. And neither Ray or I were thinking dolomite. And, and I've taught, you know, geology for a long time now and, you know, 30 years here at Cedarville. And I've trained a lot of, you know, young geology students how to recognize carbonate rocks. And I failed on this outcrop miserably. Uh, just because I wasn't expecting it. And, you know, I came away from that outcrop thinking, oh, this is a, a chert deposit or something like that. I didn't even think dolomite. And so Ray uh, took this stuff back to the lab. He was kind of unsure about what it was as well. We didn't even think about getting our acid bottles out and testing it, which we could have done in the field. Uh, but he uh, used XRD and XRD you take a little bit of the powder of this rock and and put it in an x-ray machine and uh, it'll tell you what the mineral is and it came out to be dolomite we're like of course <laughs> you know but uh, here's these uh, dolomite beds in the Coconino and again uh, dolomite has to form under some really unusual and special conditions it, it doesn't form in the world today uh, a lot of workers think that it's forming under some special hot water conditions or something like that, uh, really hot water, like, you know, several hundred degrees uh, above the boiling point of water. Um, but uh, we have these dolomite uh, beds in the Coconino now. And so that goes along really nicely with uh, the cement and the, the class and the, the uh, dolomite ROMs that we're finding as well. And it's just one more evidence that, you know, we're looking at something that is clearly a marine deposit hmm. now there's there are so many different aspects to the coconino research we haven't touched on them all and we're, we're not yeah. going to get time in in this episode we haven't even begun to think about um the the vertebrate footprints you know yeah. the the animal trackways and uh we're, we're going to have to get leonard brand on at some yeah. time you know to come and talk to yeah. us about those um but as you kind of reflect on the Coconino project, as you sort of look back now on, you know, all, all of these discoveries, what are the lessons do you think that you can draw from your experience having worked on the Coconino like this? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, Paul. And I, I think the lessons are that, that we shouldn't be afraid as, as scientists to go out and, and really take a close and careful look at whatever we're studying. And, and we wanna make sure um, that we do look at it carefully. And so, you know, uh, as we started off, we read the literature to find out what other people thought about it. Um, early on, we did a lot of field work uh, and, you know, found out what the formation was like. And so uh, those are aspects of a project that sometimes people uh, forget about or don't do a very good job of. And so we did a very good job there. And that led to a number of laboratory um, experiments and observations that we made uh, about looking at the rock under the microscope, doing the experiments with the mica and, and some other things. And, you know, as scientists, we, we shouldn't be afraid to go out and, and look at the data uh, very carefully. And, you know, that, that's the important piece. You know, what actually does the data say? Um, it was, um, I had fear and trembling after I, you know, had read a lot of literature on the Coconino because everybody was saying it looks like this, it looks like that. And, you know, I was expecting fully to be able to see that, you know, when I actually, you know, looked at the rock under the microscope and, 
you know, I, I was shocked. I was surprised at, at what we found. And that just gives me confidence uh, in other uh, research projects and so on is just to, you know, go out there and honestly find out what the data says. And, you know, Todd, you, you probably experienced the same thing in biology as well uh, with uh, the molecular stuff and so on. You know, sure. let's not be afraid of the data, uh, but let's go out and find out what it really says. And, and I'm convinced um, that a lot of times we're going to see very clearly that it supports a biblical view of Earth history, mm. not just in geology, but biology as well. Right. Mm. That's great. Uh, so, John, um, what does the future hold? What, what are you working on now? What, what's coming next, do you think? Yeah, there's a couple projects uh, I have. I want to work on this, uh, this crossbed uh, project a little bit more. Um, I'm involved uh, with a group that's uh, uh, working on the Navajo uh, sandstone. That's the big uh, crossbedded sandstone in Zion. Uh, we're seeing many of the same things there that we see in the Coconino with uh, mica and the sorting and, and, and on and on. But uh, another project uh, working on a bit is uh, over in Jordan and Israel. Uh, so we're working on the uh, flood, post-flood boundary uh, in that area and, wow. and, and trying to uh, understand how the geology meets archaeology. You know, where does yeah. that actually begin to happen? And I think uh, there's going to be some, some surprises there. Um, it's going to help us yeah. understand a little bit, you know, when we say Eocene or, or Miocene or something like that, what do we really mean? Um, and uh, uh, there's some surprises there for sure, I, I think I'm beginning to realize. So, <laughs> Sounds great. And um, people can uh, obviously find you uh, if they look up the Cedarville University website so they can find out more about all of the uh, work that you've done and the research that you're continuing to do. And of course, uh, another plug for the book, yeah. The Heavens and the Earth. Absolutely. People can look up the textbook. Um, it's it's uh, an excellent textbook, um, well worth having on your, your bookshelf. And um, John, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been a really interesting uh, conversation. Uh, it's been great to get an insight into the work that you've done. And, you know, I've I've enjoyed being part of it, too, over all of these years. It's been an absolutely fantastic experience. And I, I know that our listeners are going to really appreciate hearing this. So That's, thanks very much. It's really fun to be with you guys today. Thanks for having me. That's great. Everybody, um, do check us out at uh, coresci.org forward slash podcast. That's C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot O-R-G forward slash podcast. Uh, there you'll find all of the information about all of the streaming platforms that we're on and also all of the show notes for all of our episodes. Uh, do send in your questions and comments. We love to hear from our listeners and viewers. Uh, you can email us at podcast at coresci.org. Uh, don't forget to check us out on social media and to leave us a like, uh, share our episodes with your friends, uh, subscribe and uh, hit the notification bell, leave us a positive review, all of those things. And uh, that will just help us continue to reach more people with uh, the content that we're producing. And please, 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 as we always say at the end of these episodes, uh, and we do it again unapologetically, if you like what we do, uh, please consider supporting us, uh, leaving us a, a donation. Um, both our organisations um, really appreciate all of the support, uh, all of the support that we receive. Um, Todd, how do people uh, support Core Academy? How do they find you? You can find us at coresci.org. Uh, that's C-O-R-E-S-C-I.org. There you'll find a link to our donate page where there'll be information on where you send your checks, where you... Uh, want to send your PayPal payment, however you want to make it. You can even become a monthly supporter. And we really, really, really value and appreciate our monthly supporters who give us that steady income to make sure that we get through the, the months between the big giving seasons. So, Yeah. And likewise, with uh, Biblical Creation Trust, uh, we appreciate all of the donations that we receive. Check us out at Biblical Creation trust.org biblicalcreationtrust.org on the home page you'll find a donate button and if you click on the donate button it takes you to a giving page with all of the various options laid out there and uh, check us out also on social media 
subscribe to our prayer news all of those those things help us uh it's been a great episode and uh, we're looking forward to next time we don't quite know what's coming next so uh tune in in a couple of weeks time to find out what's coming um and we'll see you then see you soon bye for now Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Let's Talk Creation. If you have questions, send them to podcast at coreside.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. And check us out on social media. Thank you.